Hey, what's up everyone? Manesh, the psychedelic scientist here. In today's video, I'm going to be diving deep into the scientific research on psychedelic microdosing. Before I start, I just want to say that the editing for this video was sponsored by Entheotech Bioscience, which is a bioscience company based in BC, Canada, that's focused on the research and development of products and protocols to promote health and wellness using substances such as psilocybin, medicinal mushrooms, and ketamine. Go check them out. So what is psychedelic microdosing? It involves ingesting a very small amount of a psychedelic drug, most commonly psilocybin mushrooms or LSD, on a semi-regular basis to improve things like mood, well-being, creativity, attention, and problem solving. And people also often use them to self-medicate anxiety or depression symptoms. When I say a very small dose, I'm talking about a tenth or less of a standard macrodose that you would take to go on a full psychedelic trip. At this dosage level, the effects are barely perceptible, if at all. You don't trip or even necessarily feel like you're under the influence of a drug. When microdosing, people usually take it in the morning and just go about their day as usual. They'll take the kids to school, go to work, and do their thing as if they didn't have some psychedelic molecules coursing through their brain. And apparently, it leads people to have very good days. Although people have likely experimented with microdosing in some form since the 1960s, it was popularized more recently back in 2011 when James Fadiman, a seasoned elder in the psychedelic space who was involved with psychedelic research back in the 60s, discussed the concept of microdosing in his book, The Psychedelic Explorer's Guide. Since then, particularly starting around 2015 for some reason, the concept of microdosing has exploded in the culture. Many top media outlets have covered the story, documenting, for example, how Silicon Valley entrepreneurs and software developers are now commonly using microdosing to gain a competitive edge and to generate creative ideas. And if you do a quick search on Google or any social media platform, you'll find that microdosing programs, educational resources, and even microdosing coaches are becoming increasingly more common and widespread. Microdosing has basically become a whole industry unto itself. The essential question here, however, is does microdosing actually have the effects that are so commonly claimed? How much of the effects might just be placebo effects related to the strong positive expectations that people have? Just so we're all on the same page, the placebo effect refers to the ability for an inert substance that has no effects, like a sugar pill or salty water, to lead to benefits in people who think they got an active drug. This is a consistent effect found in drug trials and suggests that positive expectations alone can lead to significant effects, reflecting the deep interconnectedness of mind, brain, and body. To say that a drug has real effects, it has to do significantly better than the placebo effect that was found in that same study. With this in mind, we need to acknowledge that the majority of claims about the effectiveness of microdosing are anecdotal and don't control for placebo effects. Which is to say, they consist mainly of people trying it on themselves in an informal way and then posting on places like Reddit or YouTube about how it did or didn't help them. Relatedly, it's the case that with Fadiman's book and the increasing media coverage, people are becoming more and more heavily biased to expect positive effects. If everywhere online you're seeing people report how it helped them overcome their depression, anxiety, or addiction, or it helped them boost their productivity or find new creative solutions to problems, then of course you're going into it with very high expectations. And this provides the perfect conditions for a very strong placebo effect. These two points in mind, any scientifically minded individual is rightly very skeptical of the anecdotal reports which have flooded the internet. All right. With all that said, let me provide an overview of the scientific research on microdosing so far, and let's see whether it suggests that microdosing is placebo or not. An important distinction right out the gate is between observational studies and double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trials. The latter involves randomly assigning patients to either a drug condition or a placebo condition without them or the researchers knowing which of them they got until the end of the trial and then comparing the effects. In contrast, an observational study is one in which researchers study people in the general public who are already planning on starting some microdosing regimen, and it basically involves having them fill out questionnaires on a regular basis while they're microdosing in their day-to-day -day life. Such studies don't involve bringing them into a lab and researchers don't have to go through the regulatory and monetary issues of acquiring and administering the drugs themselves. And the majority of microdosing studies have been conducted in this way for the obvious reason that they're much easier and cheaper to conduct. However, importantly, they usually don't include a placebo group and it's hard to gauge expectation effects. All right, let's discuss the observational research so far. To date, observational studies have found that subjects report significant improvements in a variety of measures of mood, well-being, and cognition. For example, one study found that compared to non-microdosers, microdosers reported less dysfunctional attitudes, 
less negative emotions, greater open-mindedness, and greater creativity. Another study found that microdosers reported improved mood, decreased anxiety, and enhanced memory, attention, and sociability. However, these studies included no measure of what expectations the individuals had and whether this was correlated with improvements. Tackling this, a recent observational study also asked subjects about their expectations. Similar to the other two, subjects in this study reported improvements on various measures, including on well-being, depression symptoms, anxiety symptoms, social connectedness, nature-relatedness, and more. However, and this is the important part, their pre-assessed expectations were significantly predictive of these improvements. That is, the more they expected to improve, the more they improved. So this correlation suggests the presence of a significant placebo effect in these subjects and calls into question the interpretation that the drug effect is driving the improvements itself. So far, this research suggests that people do commonly experience improvements from microdosing, at least based on their own assessments, but that the placebo effect is likely a strong driver of them. One last observational study that I want to mention puts a bit of a wrench into this and adds some complexity. Similar to the others, this study found that microdosing led to self-reported improvements in a whole variety of measures. However, this study had a notable additional finding. This study also asked subjects about their expectations and had the interesting finding that people were very bad at predicting how they would improve. In general, the results showed that people had very high expectations for most of the measures. However, they often didn't improve in the measures they thought they would and improved more in measures they had less expectations for. For example, subjects were very confident they would improve on measures of creativity, of being in mindfulness, but they did not improve in these in this study. They also thought they would score lower on how neurotic they are, but they actually scored higher. And this is really interesting. It shows that although strong expectations were present, the actual effects of microdosing were often very different from what they expected. This study therefore goes a bit against the last one I mentioned and provides evidence that microdosing might actually be more than just expectation effects. And at the same time, it suggests that people have inaccurate beliefs and expectations about how microdosing will affect them. So to summarize so far, observational studies have found subjects report a range of improvements, but these changes are sometimes not consistent across studies. And they are also inconclusive about the placebo effect because they suggest that expectation effects do likely play a major role, perhaps not in all the effects or all the time. Now let's talk about the few studies that did include a placebo group. There were actually only three microdosing studies that did this, all with LSD, and they administered a standardized dose in a lab environment. The first of these measured and compared the subjective effects of 6.5, 13, and 26 micrograms of LSD in healthy subjects. For reference, a standard microdose of LSD is around 10 to 15 micrograms. This wasn't really a microdosing study like the others, and was more of a basic study looking at whether people feel anything on these dosages. It therefore used a bit more of a limited set of measures. All in all, to put it briefly, this study indicated very subtle to no effects of LSD microdosing on mood or cognitive performance when compared to placebo. A second study by the same group looked at the effects of 5, 10, and 20 micrograms of LSD in an older adult population to gauge safety for using LSD as a treatment for Alzheimer's. It reported that LSD microdosing was indeed safe in this population and that it led to negligible subjective effects compared to placebo. Finally, a third study that used the placebo control design investigated whether microdoses of LSD can increase the presence of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, aka BDNF, a protein involved in neuroplasticity. This study found that BDNF was increased after 5 micrograms and 20 micrograms of LSD at around 5 hours after ingestion. This suggests that microdoses, similar to full macrodoses, may be able to boost neuroplasticity in the brain. It's fair to say that these placebo-controlled studies are relatively unimpressive in the results, and they also don't really attempt to evaluate microdosing how it's actually used in terms of repeated doses according to some regimen. A recent study, however, did just that. They used a really clever approach and conducted what is essentially a placebo-controlled observational study. This study is arguably the strongest microdosing study to date and evaluates whether microdosing effects are better than placebo when microdosing is done in real life according to common dosing protocols. This study is described as a self-blinding citizen science study in that while the researchers told the participants what to do and provided access to online questionnaires to collect data, the participants conducted it all from their homes themselves. I won't go into the specific details of how this was done, but essentially the study had participants create a set of microdosing and placebo capsules themselves, put them into envelopes alongside QR codes given by the researchers, and were ultimately blinded to which envelopes contained the placebo doses or microdoses. Importantly, through the QR codes, code system, the researchers did know if they took placebos or not. Participants followed a schedule where they microdosed or placebo dosed four times a week, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, Friday for four weeks straight and outcomes were measured every week. The results of this study indicated that subjects reported significant increases in well-being, 
mindfulness, life satisfaction, and the personality domain of openness. They also showed reduced paranoia and reduced neuroticism. However, and this is the critical part, none of these increases were significantly different from placebo. None of them. This means that all of these significant improvements were also observed in people who thought they were microdosing when really they were taking empty capsules. This suggests that the effects reported by people who microdose are just the result of positive expectations and the consequent placebo response. The researchers had also asked participants to guess whether they took a microdose or a placebo dose. And when they analyzed this data, they found that regardless of whether they actually consumed a placebo or a microdose, when they guessed that they had taken a microdose, they scored higher. To quote the researchers directly, these results strongly suggest that the actual content of capsules did not determine differences between the conditions, but beliefs about their content did. Before we conclude that this puts a nail in the coffin on microdosing, there are a few limitations to keep in mind. First, subjects varied in the specific drug they took, although it was mostly psilocybin, LSD, or the legal gray zone alternative 1P LSD. Second, it is impossible to know the purity or actual dosages that were used. For example, someone might cut up a blotter of LSD into 10 squares and assume that each represents 10 micrograms. But the actual content on a blotter can vary widely if it was obtained from illicit sources. Third, at the end of the day, it's impossible to know whether subjects actually follow the protocol as they're supposed to. There's definitely an element of trust involved. However, it's worth pointing out that these first two limitations indicate that although the study might not be a reliable assessment of controlled clinical efficacy, they do provide an accurate assessment of microdosing as it's actually practiced in real life, which is what most people are referring to when they're speaking about microdosing anyway. In conclusion, therefore, it seems that microdosing does lead to a variety of improvements in individuals, spending mood, well-being, and cognition. However, the evidence to date strongly suggests that all, if not the majority of these effects are placebo. At the least, positive expectations and the placebo effect undoubtedly play a large role in the effects that most people report. One thing that's important to know is that all the studies to date have been conducted with healthy individuals. Perhaps microdosing might have a real positive effect for individuals suffering from mental health conditions such as depression or anxiety. More research is certainly needed and is ongoing on that front. Something suggestive of a real effect was the study showing increases in the marker of neuroplasticity, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, after microdosing LSD. To me, this suggests that microdosing may prove to have a greater positive effect relative to placebo when it is combined with a specific intervention. For example, if microdosing is combined with a meditation or mindfulness practice, or even just with a conscious intention to create new habits or let go of old ones, boosts in your plasticity from microdosing may synergize and lead to faster or better outcomes. More research is definitely needed on how microdosing may complement or synergize with other practices or psychotherapeutic interventions. All right, that's it for this video. If you have any questions or comments, drop them below and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos on the latest in psychedelic science.